Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to share my screen with you and we'll kick this off. So share screen. Okay. So thank you so much for joining me tonight. I really appreciate it. The purpose of this is to share some recent research when it comes to learning. Now, I've done some sessions before in the past, but this is going to be slightly different to what I've covered before. The whole point of this is for you guys as parents to understand how learning happens and how your child can improve their memory when it comes to learning. I'm also going to give you a little bit of an oversight to how the UK-based education system works, because your child is in a UK-based school in KMAP, which is going to be different to US-based systems and Canadian systems. So a lot of the research I'm going to be using is from uh, these three people, learning scientists, Education Endowment Foundation and um, Robert Bjork's Learning and Forgetting Lab. Yes, there is a lab um, at UCLA called Learning and Forgetting, believe it or not. Um, so I'm lucky enough to have worked um, previously in a school which worked very closely with the university when it came to teaching and learning. And we were used as a guinea pig uh, for, we could say, scientific experiments to what actually helps children understand and what helps children remember things. There's no perfect formula, there never is, but there's definitely some things that we can do in school and that you could do at home, that your child can do in school and at home to help your child long-term. This presentation will be sent out to parents, but also I'm gonna be sending out some um, guides, which I'm hoping you guys would be able to use with your child as well. So the whole point is supporting your child. Can you get anything from this yourself? Yeah, this might help you in your own life as well. So, right, there's some more people just joining now. Let's just quickly accept them. There we go, happy days. Okay, so what we have on the screen is a uh, surgeon. I don't know too much about surgery. I'm not gonna pretend to be an expert on surgery, but what I would say is that, Sorry, guys, if you can mute yourselves, that'd be great. I can hear an echo, that's all. So if everyone can put themselves on mute, that'd be really good. I appreciate that, thank you. I'll just... Okay, so a patient's rushed into ER. I've seen this on TV quite a few times. And the surgeon doesn't have too much time to adapt to the situation. But a surgeon working in ER would be an expert. They'll be an expert in their field. Like I'm seeing at the moment a nose doctor because my nose absolutely sucks at the moment. That nose doctor is an expert in noses. They may not be an expert in other areas of the body, but they are an expert in their domain. Being an expert in their domain means that they're able to see a problem, they're able to pull out the information what they need quite quickly, and they'll be able to hopefully problem solve. Now, the reality is your children are not experts. Yeah, sorry, I'm just saying. Guys, if you don't mind muting yourself, that'd be great. I'll just mute everybody. Okay, there we go. So your children are going to be doing 10, 9, 8 different subjects. They're not going to be experts in that subject, but we can actually help them become experts in topics in that subject. So that they see a problem and they're able to solve that problem quite comfortably, quickly. Now, a lot of it is relying on experience and memory. And I'll come back to that. Now, very quickly, an overview. What we have is key stage three, key stage four, and key stage five. These are terms we as teachers use, and you might have heard us use these terms before. If your child is in key stage three, they're in year seven, year eight, or year nine. Key stage four, year 10, 11, and key stage five, your child would be in year 12 and year 13. If your child is in seven, eight, or nine year, year group seven, eight, or nine, they will not be sitting a public GCSE exam. They will be doing exams in our school, but they're not a public exam. They're set by our teachers in our school. The results are used just for our school. The results are used to help us guide our next steps in our teaching. But basically, it is internal. When your child gets to year 10, they will pick their GCSEs, which is specialised subjects they're choosing to do. Normally, they'll be doing their exams at the end of year 11. So think about it. Your child, in, when they're 11 years old, joins the school. But their first actual exams, which do count towards their future, are sat five years later. 
keep that in mind. And then we have A-levels, which is year 12 and year 13, where at the end of each year, again, they'll sit some public exams. AS and A-level, which is four subjects, and it's a lot deeper. So it's like expert level. So that is how the UK-based system is set up. So we've got to deal with as teachers, your children have to deal with as kids, and you guys as parents have to be aware of that whatever we teach your children at 11 years old, they're going to have to also be able to be comfortable in it and recall it and use it when they're 16 years old. A lot. Now think about the amount of subjects your children are doing. Some doing 10 different subjects. Within those 10 different subjects, there'll be like per year, 10 plus topics. Each topic will be broken down into subtopics. So you can see what's happening. Lots and lots and lots and lots of information that your child is not only having to understand, but also remember, and there's a difference. And we'll talk about that. Any questions so far? Feel free to use the mic. No questions, I can't check the chat. Let me just check the chat. Everything okay. Excellent, okay, I'll move forward then. So before we begin, I'm just gonna go over some myths. Oh no, not, yes I am. Some myths of learning. So these myths are things which, when you're growing up, you might have been told this is the case. It's been proven to be wrong. Number one, you can see learning. You cannot see people learn. Experiment, two people, two kids were sat in a room. One person was watching both kids learn or thought they were watching them learn. At the end of the experiment, the examiner was asked which child learned more than the other. One of the children was putting their hand up all the time. The other child was putting their hand up sometimes, they were sitting tests, and over time, the examiner thought, yep, I'll be able to say that this child's been learning, this child's not learned as much. The end result, though, was completely and utterly skewed. The child who wasn't as confident actually was learning more. The difference was that the child who was struggling with confidence, it took them longer to appreciate the material. It clicked. Another example I had in my last school, a lesson observation from Ofsted. Ofsted are like dudes who come into school, inspectors, which we're going to have in our school soon. They'll come into a lesson and they'll rate your lesson. So they sat in my lesson and they're giving me scores out of different things, how good my questions were, how good my instructions were, all these different categories. And at the end of the lesson, this child said, sir, I don't get it. I still don't get it. It's not clicked. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, this isn't going to look good. And the inspector put it as a negative. Overnight, child went to bed, slept. The next day, the child came to me and said, I do get it now. It's clicked. And learning can be like that. And I wish the inspector saw that, but we didn't see that. But learning isn't always instantaneous. You can't always see learning. A child daydreaming out the window could still be processing information. Keep that in mind. The second thing is progress, which is this over here. Progress isn't always going up like that. Progress will actually go up and down. Every time your child forgets something, progress will go down. They'll go backwards because forgetting is natural. Every time you teach a new concept, they'll decline because it's new to them. So keep in mind that a child isn't always, if they're meant to be getting an A star, aren't always going to hit that A star. And that's natural. We can all relax about that because it's the end goal. And that's what I'm going to talk about on the next bit. If we focus on performance, it doesn't mean we're focusing on learning. There's a difference between performance and learning. Learning is over time. Our job as teachers is to make sure that your children are ready when they sit their exams, when they're 16, 17, and 18 years old. So performances, if they're in year seven, for example, and they've got a test coming up on fractions, and the day before the test, they start revising it and cramming in all that information, and they get an A star for it, and they go home and they celebrate that A star. Mom, 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 I got an A star for my fractions. And you guys are like, well done, you're brilliant, you're right on it. But if it's not being consolidated properly because they've been cramming it, guess what's gonna happen to all that information? It goes. Sorry. 
it disappears. And if we focus just on grades, if we focus just on performance, the problem is that we're actually putting a disadvantage to long-term learning. If everyone's obsessing on the here and now, the grades, what we won't be focusing on is skills over time, learning over time. And the final one is that we have a preferred learning style. You guys would have heard visual learners, auditory learners, kinesthetic learners, et cetera. Yes, sometimes we might prefer certain methods, but actually the best way to learn is to have a mixture of everything. That's the most effective way to learn, having little bits of everything combined together. So those are myths, which I wanna clarify right now. And throughout this, I'm gonna be bringing your attention back to this. Okay, so I'm hoping everyone's following me so far. Again, if you've got any questions, feel free to interrupt me. So I want you to meet Joe. Joe is a student who in lessons is getting everything right. The teacher says, oh, you got an A star, brilliant. The problem is not remembering it later. And believe me, this happens to adults, this happens to kids. Just because you get it in the lesson doesn't mean it's gonna stick in your brain. So when they see a problem later, they're like this. Oh, I know the answer to this. I know the answer to this. I know it, I know it. Great. Imagine a doctor in surgery doing that. Oh, I know the answer to this. I know how to solve this surgery. No, you can't have that. We want fluency. So it's up to us as teachers. It's up to your child. It's up to you guys as parents to support a culture where we can actually help your child remember things for later on. So again, this is all about Joe to begin with. So the way our brain works is the following. We discover a new stimulus, like a new word, for example. And what happens is that will go into our sensory memory. Now, if I'm paying attention in class, it will go into my working memory. If I'm daydreaming completely, it might straight away not even reach my working memory. If your child is learning something new at home, and we've got YouTube on in the, in the background. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, if it's something new, it isn't gonna get into their working memory. It's superficial. So straight away, they're gonna forget it. When it's in the working memory, it's your child's job. It's our job as teachers to help it get into your child's long-term memory. If you're doing different activities. And again, I'm gonna be giving some tips about how that can happen. Because when it's in the long-term memory, it's got a much higher chance for your child to remember things. If it stays in a working memory, the issue with working memory is it's like a bathtub. It's limited. The more water you pour in the bathtub, it then overflows. When it overflows, we lose things. And that's with memories. So when you tell, tell your kids before you go out, hey, Joe, I want you to do this. Clean your room, go upstairs, uh, get some socks on, blah, blah, blah. And you give them a checklist. Guess what? They're going to forget that information. It's going to create what we call a cognitive overload. Working memory is tiny. Kids will forget things. So again, what we want to do is put it into their long-term memory and help them retrieve things. So again, if you find that your child forgets things quickly, it might be because it's not actually reaching their long-term memory. I am dyslexic, severely dyslexic. My working memory is limited, but there are strategies which can help me put it into my long-term memory. And those strategies help everybody, which I'll talk about today. So I'm gonna give you a scenario. I'm teaching computer science a concept called logic gates. In, your, in year seven, your child, we did a test, got an A star in September on logic gates. In January, I give them a test on logic gates again. Uh-oh, progress has gone down. It's now an A grade. At the end of the year, I give them a test on it again. I've thrown some questions. And for logic gates, they score a B. Not good. But here's the thing. In year eight, they also need to do logic gates. The problem is, because they've forgotten things, especially over the summer holiday, and as you can see, it's declining over time, I'm going to have to reteach aspects. If I don't reteach it as a teacher, the grades are going to get lower and lower to a certain point. We forget things, as I said, naturally. If we don't use something, we lose it. The problem is, how do we ensure that your child is practicing different aspects constantly? 
when I was in school, I learned Latin. Yep, Latin. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. The point being, it was hard for me to practice unless I sat down and studied it because I didn't use it in my everyday life. I didn't use those skills in my everyday life. I wasn't going to go to like a shop and start talking Latin. You can't do it. Languages is a different concept, like Spanish and French, because if you go to those countries, you can practice it part of your everyday life. If you've got parents who are native speakers, you can practice with them. So it actually gives that opportunity of some sort of natural practice. But again, keep in mind, folks, your child getting an A star in an assessment doesn't necessarily mean that they are an A star in long-term learning. It means at that point in time, in terms of progress, they're an A star. But when it comes to learning, learning is if it's consolidated over time. And that's what we need to be looking at. Not the short term, the long term. I'm going to move forward unless anyone's got any questions on that so far. Okay. Again, feel free to interrupt me. This, ladies and gentlemen, is called the forgetting curve. It's by a guy called Dr. Ebbinghaus. I think I pronounced his name properly. I hope I did. In a lesson, if I've done a brilliant job of teaching your child, they've taken in 100% information. But look how quickly it takes for your child to or yourselves to forget that information over seven days if it's not revisited. I may as well have not taught that lesson based on that. It's scary. And then multiply that by the amount of subjects your child is doing. Then multiply that by all the distractions in your child's lives. They might do football, so they have coaching. Guess what? It influences our forgetting care because it goes into our uh, working memory and that oversaturates it. It oversaturates our long-term memory. So we're dealing with a lot of negative factors. Scary. Keep this in mind. So again, if your child in class is demonstrating a lot of understanding, they're getting things right, they do a test in that class and they get 100% on that test, it doesn't necessarily mean they've learned it at that point in time. And that's the message I'm going to keep saying to you guys. This is called the new theory of disuse. The way it works is the following. We have what's called storage strength going down the side and retrieval strength going across the top. Example, when I went to England last year, I had to stay in a hotel. I had to stay in a hotel because my parents didn't want me staying at their home. Uh, they didn't want me staying at their home. I have no idea why. So I stayed in the hotel. Sucky I know. Point being, I have no idea what the hotel room number was from last year. No idea. Because it wasn't in my storage strength in high, it's in low, I, there's no way I can remember it. No way. Because it's in the retrieval low, there's no way I can remember it. It's practically impossible. Let's imagine that I've gone to a hotel for a week on vacation. You will remember that room number for that week. So if your child says to you, hey, mom or dad, what's the room number? You'll be able to say, oh, it's room 14B. You'll be able to do it quickly. You'll be able to retrieve it quickly. It's quick to come out of your brain. I'm hoping that makes sense so far. It's very quick to come out of your brain, but it is not deep in your brain because you have only using it for that week over time. So let's imagine you've had your vacation five weeks ago, over time, it will move into this box here where you'll just completely forget it. So during your vacation, it'll be here, but over time, it'll go here. Now, my childhood phone number, in my storage strength, it's high, it's consolidated in my brain. It's there somewhere. I just need to think about it. What is my childhood phone number? And this is a moment, folks, where we're like this all the time. I know it. I know it. Oh, I, I can pull it out. It's 01159602909. And once I've remembered it, it'll go into quick retrieval. So my storage is high, but my retrieval is low. That means it's going to take me quite a bit of time to think of it again. But my current phone number, which I've had for years, 
07960863647. Boom. It's in my brain. It's in my long-term memory. It's consolidated. It's there for a long time. And it's got high retrieval strength. I can remember it quickly. We want your children to be able to learn things so that it is in high retrieval and high storage strength. So when it comes to tests and challenges, we're not sitting there doing this. I know it, 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 I know it. It's like when you hear a song, a song, and you're trying to remember the name of the song. And you bet I know the name of the song. That is where it's here. So our job is to get your children to be here. But it's not that easy. And it's a partnership with everybody. Any questions about that so far? <coughs> nope. But I'm hearing some weird music. So I'm just going to put people on mute again. I don't know why that's happening. There we go. Okay. So let's move forward again. Now, if your child knows there's a test coming up the next day and they study for that test and they're cramming for that test, we are creating a false economy. What we're doing is we're doing this. By your child studying the night before a, a big test. But we're not actually enabling it to be in their long-term memory in high storage, unless we're practicing over time. If they're practicing over time, that's different. But if they're deciding, uh oh, I've got a test tomorrow, I haven't done any work for it, I'm going to start studying now. Guess what? It'll be here. Guess what? In year seven and year eight, you can get away with that. They might get an A star for that because the amount of content isn't huge. So you can actually practice 30 facts and probably get 20 of them right. They get an A star. You're like, Great job. The teacher's like, great job. The issue is, because it's not in high storage, guess where it's going to go? Into low storage again. They're going to forget it again. And when it comes to the end of the year, where they've got like 300 facts to learn, they won't be able to cram. They won't be able to do this. What's going to happen is it will create an overload in their working memory. So for small pieces of information, cramming works. No doubt. But when it comes to tests over a period of time, it isn't going to work. It isn't. So encouraging your child the night before they've got a test to say, have you studied for that test? No? Study now. Great. But why haven't they been studying since the start of the year? Why haven't they been practicing things? Because all we're doing is simply creating that false picture. Any questions about that so far? Okie dokie. Remember, I'm not checking the chat. In fact, I'll just have a quick look at the chat very quickly. Uh, so just bear with me one second whilst I work out how to use Zoom. No, I'm not doing it because I can't do it because I don't know how to do it. It's not working. So if you do have a question, please, please, please use the mic. Okay. So going to move forward. The great news is there is a way to remember things for longer and beat that forgetting curve. We can beat it. And it's using a concept called space repetition, which I have gone over before with some people. In a class, I teach something really well. Your child learns something new for the first time. Brilliant. As before, they start forgetting it. At the end of the day or the next day, if your child reviews what they've done by testing themselves and then looking at the gaps, look what happens to the amount they remember. It goes back up again. And then look what happens the next time they forget. This is basically saying it's going to take them longer to forget the next time. So this, it took them a day to forget. Now it's going to take them a couple of days and they'll probably forget. So as soon as they start forgetting things, test themselves again. Oh, look, we're back to 100% again. And look what happens over time. It takes longer to forget. That means we don't have to revisit it for longer periods of time. And over time, it'll come to a stage where your child does not need to study it again for months or even years. There'll be things which will be so deep in your child's story strength, 
that they can chill out when it comes to that and they can focus on other areas. And this is called spaced repetition. Now, that is one version of practice which I'll talk about again in a bit, and it is a solution. It works if your child does it, but it involves practice over time, not cramming things for a test, because when we're cramming for a test, your child's starting point is down here. It'll go up to 100%, but they'll forget it just as quick again. Keep that in mind. There is something called deliberate practice. And this is how your child should be practicing. And it's something you can support. When we practice, if your child is studying and practicing for an hour at a time, it will not be effective. Think about it. When we get tired, we do not perform. So what is the point? When I get tired, I start daydreaming. I start you know, glazing out of things. I don't perform. Deliberate practice is all about small practice, pushing yourself to your limit, knowing your weaknesses and doing it again. So take this concept of tennis. We're going to call this lady Mary. Mary, Mary. She's just done something in tennis. She's practicing a stroke. It isn't too good. So she's actually thinking about it. She's sitting down. She's reflecting on it. How can I do it better next time? She then tries it again. But all of this takes place in a small period of time. It's like playing an instrument, for example, playing a song. You make a mistake, you stop, and you play it again, but you learn from that mistake as quick as you can, as quick as possible, with high intensity. If you're studying for geography, it is practicing a concept from memory, looking at your notes, where have you gone wrong, and then practicing it again immediately afterwards to rectify it. Deliberate practice is very effective. But if your child is not doing deliberate practice and they're simply just chilling out, okay, not drinking coffee, but if they're chilling out, just reading over their books and they're calling that study, it is not effective. And we'll talk about that. Practice needs to be where you're pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone. That is deliberate practice. Any questions about that? Small chunked push. Sorry? Okay, I'll take that wasn't a question. Okay. So there's a study done. This study was done on, I think it was 300 different schools in the United Kingdom. And just for the record, the United Kingdom at the moment is very, very far ahead in terms of using evidence-based practice in schools. That means research-based methods. That means teaching and study methods, which has a high impact above most schools in the world, America, Canada, this island, it is up there. Not all schools, but it's moving towards there. I'm hoping that these methods will be adapted by everybody so that we can also take advantage of it. So this study, as I said, was done with a couple of hundred schools. And one group of schools were taught some material where they would study. And when I mean study, that would mean read over your notes, five minutes a day. So on day one, they'll study the new notes. Day two, they'll read over their notes. Day three, they would read over their notes. Day four, they would read over their notes for five minutes a day. The final day of the week, they'll get a test. The other group, on day one, they would study, i.e. they were taught some new information, like I'm doing now with you guys. The next day, they would test themselves. Testing is good. Testing has a bad rap. When everyone says test, it's, oh my gosh, test, great. No, testing means challenge. It can be done in so many different ways. So day two, challenge. Day three, challenge. Day four, challenge. Then test. What we're going to see now are the results of both of those things. Okay, so this took place for the test for five minutes after the first. So we're talking about this test here. The people who studied scored higher than the people who are testing themselves 
every five minutes a day. So people who read over the notes scored higher. But after a week and two days, those students who simply tested themselves and did deliberate practice and looked for their mistakes. So what they would do is they would test themselves. They would then look at their work. They'll then look at the notes and then compare them and then make changes to those notes to improve themselves. Look at how much higher they remembered information. So these are the amount of facts we called. And then after another week, so we're now talking two weeks. Look at the difference between the two. Yes, things have dropped. But keep in mind that these people have not looked at or tested themselves on this information since then. So it's actually been two weeks since they've looked at the notes and looked at the facts. So imagine if they were still practicing at a high level. So again, studying by reading over things and taking it easy has a tiny impact. That is low. Imagine what this would be like over a month or a year. Or if for your child, year seven, year eight, year nine, year 10, and then year 11. Keep that in mind. So going back to Joe. If Joe starts doing some space repetition, as I explained, testing themselves, letting themselves forget, letting themselves forget, testing themselves again, letting themselves forget, testing themselves again, letting themselves forget. Over time, it will take it longer for them to forget. There are methods what you can help your child do. I've gone over these before with parents, but I'm going to say it very quickly again. Imagine you've got flashcards. Imagine your child tested themselves, not read over, tested themselves on the flashcards. Every time you get something right, it moves into a new pile. These piles represent frequency of doing the flashcards or lack of frequency. So this would be every day. This would be every two days. This could be once a week. This could be once every few weeks. This could be once every month or every two months. Every time they get something right, it moves into the next pile. Every time they get something wrong, it moves back a pile. That will help create this spaced repetition. It's an artificial way of doing it, but it's still a way of doing it. When your child does flashcards, you've got to make sure that on one side of the flashcard, they've got questions or terms and the other side they've got the answer if your child is studying and it looks like this where they can see the answer and they're just reading the answer ladies and gentlemen boys and girls zero impact or minimal impact it goes back to this again reading over something is not testing yourself testing helps create long-term memory quizlet is an app where your child can actually make flashcards and it will do because they've got algorithms, especially for space repetition for your child. So Quizlet, great thing to use. Again, I'll send you all the information and the links to this later on as well. So another way we can help improve memory. In baseball, they did an experiment where they took a group of kids and they said to the kids, yo, kid, they probably didn't say that, but you get the idea. Kid, we're going to pitch five straight balls at you and you're going to hit them. So I'm going to throw them directly at you. I'm then going to pitch for you five curve balls. They're going to go wee and curve around. I'm then going to pitch, I have no idea what the term is, uh, up, down, I don't know what the term is, where it like dips. We'll call it a dip ball. I've made up the term. I'm not a baseball guy. A dip ball. Five of them in this order. Five straight, five curve, five dip balls. Guess what? The kids were amazing. The parents watching the practice were like, yo, my kid is amazing. Why do you think they're amazing? Why do you think they're on it? Because they knew what was coming. Their brain was wired up and prepared to deal with the challenge ahead. That was in training, they did very well. 
there's another group of kids where they were also pitched 15 balls, but the pitching was not done like before. It was all mixed up. And in training, the kids did bad. Nowhere near as well as the other people who were told which ones are gonna come up. Ladies and gentlemen, when it came to the actual game, which group do you think did better? The group which were told five straight balls, five curve balls, and five dip balls, or the group which were given 15 pitches, but were all mixed up? Yes, the group which was given 15 pitches and it was all mixed up. Why? Because they learned skills such as looking at what the pitcher was doing, look at the motion and having to make guesses based on that. They didn't know what was coming in training, so in games they're more prepared. If I said to your child, hey child, I'm going to give you a test tomorrow, and on that test is going to be this topic. Guess what? Your child's going to perform well. Or I say to your child, there will be a test to see how well you can do, but I'm not going to tell you what topics are going to be on it. It could be anything, so I want you to practice what we've done so far. Guess what? Your child might not perform the best on that test. They might get a C grade. Big deal. Because the end result is the match, the game, the baseball game, or the GCSE exam. Because in GCSE exams and A-level exams, we don't know what's going to be on those papers. These end of year exams, we don't really know what's going to be on those papers. Our job is to train your child doing tests, assessments, and making things as challenging as possible. Yes, building up their confidence, but making it challenging at the same time. This is called interleaved. And this is basic blocked is where I do a lesson of fractions or unit of fractions and I test your child. Interleaved is where I mix things up and I mix up the tests. So blocked is I've just taught fractions and I'm gonna give you a test on fractions. Interleaved is I've taught you fractions, I've taught you decimals, I've taught you this year this, I've taught you this year that, I'm gonna mix it all up. Let's have a look at some of the differences. When it came to practice, those who went through blocked scored higher. Kids went home with grades, parents very happy. When it came to GCSEs and A-levels and those sorts of exams, ladies and gentlemen, there you go. So how can we actually help your child interleave, mix up their practice? Well, what we can do is you can mix up the flashcards. You can have flashcards for the subject, but in different topics, all mixed up. And they can practice it. In computer science, we don't tell kids when there's going to be tests. We don't tell them what's going to be on the tests. We don't do that purposely. A, we don't want them cramming, but B, we want to see what they can do. And also, we want to see what they can handle in terms of a test situation. If your child scores low on it, it's not the end of the world because that's natural. The end goal is to make sure that your child can handle any situation and any problem in computer science when it comes to our big tests. Any questions about this so far? So right now, I've given you guys a cognitive overload, no doubt as I said right at the beginning. By giving you too much information, you're gonna start forgetting things. I might have lost some of your attention already as well. I'm hoping I haven't, but this is this in action. So, we've got another child. Meet Mary. I'm not really good with names because I used Mary earlier as well. Mary just doesn't understand things. Every year she changes her subject, her favorite subject. So she'll go and say, mom, I don't like maths anymore. Or mom, maths is now my favorite subject. And it might be quite easy to give up on things. What we're gonna look at very briefly is what we can do to support Mary, both teachers, Mary and yourself to give her more confidence. What we have is Mary starting a new topic. Let's imagine in computer science and she's a novice. I taught her some facts, but at the moment, she sees them as two isolated facts. The more she practices and the more experience she gets, eh, she's at developing stage. Eventually, I want Mary to become an expert of logic gates and computer science. That comes from literally practice 
and experience and understanding. When you become an expert, it basically allows you to fluently solve problems really quickly. So you see a problem and you're not strained to solve it because you can tap into your brain's network and you can pull out, see what's connected to it and pull out the right information. What that means is it frees up the working memory. So going right back to the beginning again, very quickly, I should have done another picture on this. If we can free up the working memory, that means that we can deal with more complex problems. So your child in the past may be really good at questions which don't have any words in them, like take maths. Your child might be able to multiply 25 times 12, but can they deal with a scenario? Like little Jimmy goes on the bus. Little Jimmy drives seven miles on the bus. Blah, 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 blah. If your child is a novice, their working memory is going to be really, really limited, and they're going to be dealing with just the problem. If they're an expert, they'll have formulas in their brain to solve the problem so they can focus on the scenario which is given to them. And that is why a lot of the time children struggle when it comes to long-winded questions. They might do well on short questions, but not the longer ones, because their memory is all, their attention is focused on the nitty gritty details if they're a novice. So for example, if I said to you guys right now as parents, what is the area of a square? How do you work it out? Some of you right away will know it, boom. Some of you won't. If you don't know the area of a square, how would you solve a scenario question where it is little Jimmy is in the bedroom, he's measuring the size of his bedroom, it's these are the um, dimensions, solve it. You won't be able to do it. You'll be bogged down by thinking, what is the area of the square? What is the area of the square? What is the area of the square? And by doing that, you can't solve the problem. Our job as teachers is to try and get your child to become experts in the different domains so that we go back to this again, the theory of disuse, that your child is able to retrieve things quickly and accurately such as formulas, such as steps and procedures and rules like grammar rules, punctuation rules, etc. At the same time, this concept comes from video games. I'm not going to pronounce the name of the guy who came up with this because I can't pronounce it. It's like 50,000 letters in his name. He's a Russian gentleman. I'm not going to try and pronounce it. Now, this applies to also education. The concept is called flow. Flow is a state where we're in where we can carry out tasks without really thinking about it. Example, have any of you guys driven home, ended up at home and thought, oh my gosh, how did I get here? Quite scary, right? It happens. When I used to walk to school in the good old days, I would sometimes walk to school, end up at being at school. I couldn't remember the journey there because my brain was in automated mode. That is a state of flow. If as a child, we find a task too difficult and our skill levels are too low. Kids get anxious, frustrated, they give up. They don't wanna fail, so they don't do the task. If your child is too bright for the task, so the task level is low, they get bored. So our job is to give them little bits of this, but keep them in the flow as much as possible. So it'll be like this. So every time we give them a challenge and they learn something new, they're here and they go back to flow state again. That is the state we want to get your child to be in. And that comes from memory and understanding. That is why your child, when we play video games, sometimes gives up quite quickly on certain video games. They, they download a new game, they play it for a bit, but they're not as good as other people. So they quit it. They rage quit because of this. When they're playing video games and they're in a flow, you know what they're like when they're in the flow because you try and talk to them and they don't want to talk to you. We want that for education as well, but I'd like them to talk to us as well. Any questions about flow so far or this? Okay. So what I'm going to talk about now is different things, what we can do to help develop your child to become an expert and also keep them in a state of flow. The first thing which is really useful is using visuals with note-taking. Note-taking isn't about copying down things off a board. 
note taking is about thinking and representing ideas, elaborating ideas. This is called dual coding. It is a very effective method that kids can use in lessons and outside of lessons. So when your child gets home and they're not doing anything, it's a good idea to actually get them to summarize what they've done in the lesson they've had today from memory. And if they did it through doing visual diagrams, such as like these, with some text with it, it helps stick in the brain. And again, I'll be giving more information and do some workshops on how to do this. So every suggestion I've given you tonight, I will be doing further workshops on them. Tonight is just an overview. Please keep that in mind. So dual coding is a great technique. The next is chunking things. Have a look at that list and try and remember all of that. And then look at it chunked. Oops, I forgot to do the animation, which gets rid of the little box. So there we go. There. Now try and look at the list and remember them. By your child categorizing notes, just like that, it breaks it down into smaller parts. Our brain is limited, as I said before, our working memory is limited. So by chunking information up, it actually helps us take in information and retain information. It helps our working memory store that information so we can put it into our long-term memory. So chunking up the notes. So if your child's got notes, ask them to chunk it. It's a good activity. Teachers will be doing it. Your child can do it. At home. It's another activity to do. Get to see them. See them doing it. Okay, I'm going to give you guys a task. We're nearly done. Got a few more minutes left. But what I'd like you to do is read that. I'm going to be asking you some questions about that. No, that's a lie. I'm not. Quickly unmute yourself if you've heard of a pomelo fruit before. Has anyone actually heard of one and can picture it? Yes. Okay. Well, found in no. Malaysia. Okay. No. If you if you have heard of it, you're not allowed to take part in this activity. It's cheating. Um, <laughs> it's going to ruin the whole thing. If you haven't heard of it, I'm now going to show you a different way to describe that. Ah. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't teach kids the above without them being able to picture it in their brain. If your child is struggling to understand things, step one is to relate it to something in their schema, in their brain, in their network, in their expert knowledge, something which they can link it to so they can visually see it. If you can think of something, you can build on it, you can understand it, you can remember it. If you can't picture it in your brain, you won't be able to remember it. Keep that in mind. So going back to this, using stories, analogies, it helps children understand to begin with. Once they understand, you can break this down because you can picture it. So if you're working with your child at home and they're struggling to understand something, my advice is to use an analogy, something which they can link it to. And then you build on the technicalities. Computer science has lots of this, very little of this. But it's my job as a teacher to do this bit first, to get the kids to be able to picture something before they can do this bit. And again, that is a reason why your child won't be able to understand things because they can't link it to things. If I said to your child, for example, I want you to imagine you're on the London Underground right now. How many of your kids have actually been on the London Underground in the first place? So how are they going to link it to anything if they haven't? So they can't picture it. So I could either show them photos or I could link it to something which they have experienced before, something which is really, really busy. 
something which is absolutely packed. On this island, I can't think of anything. Oh, I can link into supermarkets during lockdown. There you go. Buying toilet paper. That would be their first experience if they went to the supermarket with you guys. Very, very busy. People pushing each other out of the way. People panicking at times, like on the London Underground. That would be step one to get the feel for it. And we'll build it up slowly. The point being, our job is to build a schema for your child. A schema. Things that they can hook onto and retrieve. So, what I've gone over with you guys today is a just an overview. I've explained that learning is something you can't see. I can't tell if your child's learned something. I can see that, I can see outcome over time. So if anybody's asking, how's my child doing in computer science? I'll be able to say, right now, I can see they're performing like this, but I don't know if it's in their long-term memory yet. That's the truth of it. I can't tell you. So if you're saying what grades my child performing, I can't tell you. I can't tell you what we're going to get. It's impossible. Progress doesn't always go up. If your child, if you go back to flow and they learn something new, it'll go down a bit again. And that's fine. That we need to focus on learning folks, not performance, not how does your child do on this test. It's actually instead, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? my child? Are you practicing effectively? What are you finding difficult to understand? And working together on that. And we've got no learning style. I've went over with you guys about how working memory and long term memory works. I went over with you about how the fact that your child will need to remember certain concepts over five years. I went over the, uh, the forgetting curve, but you guys have probably forgotten that. We went over the new theory of disuse. We went over how cramming so if your child's got an exam tomorrow and you want to know what's on it, great. Your child's performance will be great. They'll do very well. But guess what? Doesn't mean they're going to do well long term. So you've got to make a decision as a parent what it is you really want from it. Do you want your child to be tested to find out where the gaps are, what your child's actually learnt and hasn't learnt? Or do you just want your child to get the A scale? The get the Keep that in mind. We then looked at how to beat the forgetting curve by space repetition, testing yourself, not reading things, challenging yourself from memory, deliberate practice. We then looked at bah, 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 different ways we can do space repetition, the flashcard system, making sure that flashcards are done properly. One side question, the other side answer. Quizlet, brilliant, has space repetition algorithms built in. We looked at interleaving, mixing up the practice, making sure that your child is doing different topics. We looked at the impact of it. We looked at why children do give up. Children give up because a lot of the time they can't build on their knowledge. They're not, it's not sinking, they can't picture things. They get anxious, they get frustrated, fear of failure. We gotta keep them in that fly. We looked at a technique called visual, sorry, dual coding. We didn't go in detail, why should it you? We looked at chunking as another way to get information in. And finally, we looked at using analogies. I will be doing workshops in school to support parents and also students on this, different techniques. So I'm hoping you found this quite useful. I'm hoping the philosophy has sunk with you guys and actually it hits home quite a bit. So I really thank you for attending. And anyone got any questions? Okay, I think that's a note. No questions, <laughs> but thank you so much, Mr. Levin. No problem. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. No Levin. Question. Thank no you. Que no questions. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks. Thank I appreciate you. your time. Thank you, Mr. Levin. You're thank most you. welcome. Thank you, guys. Always a great present. Thank you. Always a great presentation. But now we have to uh, we have to uh, get the kids to understand that. Yes, yeah. sir. One hundred percent. It's a partnership, definitely. Definitely. Working Thank together. You. Thank okay. you, folks. Take care. Thanks. Take care, guys. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Have Thank a good you. night, guys. And we'll see you Thank you. Good night. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank Bye. you. Do you think you'll have any of this um, training or the education for us? Pardon? Like, when do you think you'll be doing some of this training? Oh, 